good morning and welcome. The National Safety Council is a century-long organization that has been working with individuals, organizations, and business leaders, and federal agencies in the mission to help people live their fullest lives. Unfortunately, for the first time in our lifetime, the likelihood of someone dying from a preventable opioid overdose has eclipsed the odds of dying in a car crash. We cannot live our fullest lives until we do all we can to ensure that we change this outcome. Today, we have 15,000 member companies keeping people safe where they are at work. We encourage our members to take action. We encourage our policymakers to take action. And we encourage the public to take action. Our goal with raising the public awareness through this memorial is to ensure that we can do all we can to seek solutions. I'm very grateful to have the incredible host partner of the District Attorney, Singus, and all the local leaders here today to join us as we unveil the Prescribed to Death Memorial in Garden City. We are also grateful for our presenting sponsors, Norwell Health and RXR Realty, and our national sponsors, Stericycle and Schneider, as well as our support supporting sponsors, Flexon Therapeutics, Save the Michaels of the World, the Eric and Mark Blumenkrantz, and also the New York Net Mets Foundation for sponsoring this eighth national stop of the Prescribed to Death Memorial. Nearly 90% of memorial visitors have told us that they will change their behavior as a result of what they've learned. We know we're making an impact. In, 19, in 2017, New York State lost over 3,200 people to the opioid overdose. 20% of those overdoses occurred right here in Long Island. The crisis has impacted every community in our nation. In the U.S., one in four are addicted themselves, know someone who is, or know someone who has died as a result. The memorial behind me portrays the 22,000 people lost in 2015. And on top of that, we've lost 100,000 lives to prescription painkillers, heroin, and fentanyl since 2016. It's not just about the staggering statistics, but what the faces on the wall represent. The data speaks to our minds, but the individual stories speak to our hearts. The memorial not only brings visitors face to face with this everyday killer, but also encourages action so that others can help eliminate these preventable deaths. First, talk to your healthcare provider about the risks of opioids. Despite all of the news coverage, we found that one third of opioid users who are prescribed them don't realize the medication they're taking is an opioid drug. We have created warn me labels, I'll show you one here, so the public and medical pres prescribers, practitioners can have a conversation about the risks and the alternative to opioids. These are stickers you can put right on your prescription card, right on your healthcare provider card. Next, clean out your medicine cabinets. You can see a representation of that here behind me. We know that 64% of users don't get their pills from a valid prescription. Many obtain them from friends and family, so removing pills from circulation is crucial. As you tour the memorial, we invite you to pick up also a Stericycle seal and send envelope, I've got one here, and a warn me label to put on your insurance card. Take action today and dispose of your unused medications in your home. This is an action each and every one of us can take. If you're moved by what you see today, spread the word. Tell your friends and family to come visit this week while we're here at the mall. And finally, if you are an employer, and I know many of the folks here in front of me today are employers, we have launched a new Opioids at Work Employer Toolkit. We did this last week with the Surgeon General. It is free. You can download it at nsc.org backslash opioids at work and take action in your workplace. We can touch so many lives in, in bringing this conversation and resources to the places that our community members and family members work. Together we can make an impact right here in Long Island and beyond to ensure that those people deal get to live their fullest lives. 
So with that, I want to thank you for being here today, and I'm honored to introduce our next um, discuss our next presenter. It is our host partner for this event, the Nassau County District Attorney, Madeline Singus. As the chief law enforcement official serving Nassau County's 1.3 million residents, District Attorney Madeline Singus fights to ensure that Nassau remains one of the nation's safest suburban counties. She has been combating the opioid epidemic at her top concern for her office, prioritizing education to prevent addiction as well as treatment options. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Lorraine, thank you so much for uh, bringing this incredible exhibit here. Uh, I'm so moved by it, I hope, and I, I'm sure that all of you will be as well. Uh, I wanted to thank Lorraine Martin for the, from the National Safety Council uh, and all of the people working with her that were able to bring this here to Roosevelt Field. Our county executive is here, Laura Curran. Uh, Police Commissioner Ryder was here but got called out. Sharon Richmond, thank you. She's going to talk to us a little bit about what her and her family went through. Um, Roosevelt Field and Simon Properties, thank you. I see so many from the treatment community. Um, Dr. Jeff Reynolds, thank you from FCA. Steve Chasman, I saw here. Here he is from LICAD. Uh, there's so many people here, uh, and we can make change because we all are working together. Everywhere I go in Nassau County, um, it never fails. Someone will approach me. It doesn't matter if I'm on the North Shore or if I'm on uh, down South. It doesn't matter if I'm East or West. Someone will approach me at an event, at the, at the grocery store, at a movie theater, at dinner, wherever I am, uh, to share a story about a loved one who succumbed to an opioid overdose death or someone who's in the throes of addiction. Uh, and I welcome those stories because when I hear them, you know, first as the DA, second as a mom, it just motivates me to do more, to make sure that we get involved, that we're not just talking about things, but we're actually doing things. So for me, I often share those stories again when I go out and talk to people because it's a way of remembering that person. Uh, it's a way of giving recognition to the enormous pain that a family has gone through. And it's a way for us to prevent future overdoses from happening. If everywhere I go I can reach one family, uh, that's one family hopefully that can be spared uh, what Sharon and her family had to go through and so many of the people who have spoken to me. So that's what this exhibit is all about. It's about remembering those we lost and it's about prevention, education, giving people the tools they need. It's about starting conversations. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people will be passing through uh, the mall this week. And some will stop and see and be moved by this exhibit. And those are conversation starters. If somebody comes home and has a conversation about what they saw, if a parent or a child or an educator can use the information here, then we're winning, then we're doing something, then we're making a difference in someone's life. So we're all working together. What this exhibit also shows is that the person suffering is not alone, that person's family is not alone. It's time we take away the stigma uh, of talking about addiction. It's time that we openly discuss it with our young children, uh, and our older children, as well as our neighbors in our communities. I see Rabbi Pearl is here representing our faith community. Uh, and again, this is what Nassau County is doing. All of us together are talking about it and trying to work through this epidemic so that we can save lives. Uh, from my office, I'm proud to say that with Laura Curran, uh, we tasked the Heroin Prevention Task Force. Renee Victor is here. Thanks, Renee, for all your great work. Every month, we get together with so many people uh, who can have an impact on this crisis. So many of us working together to say, how can we make a difference? How can we turn people's pain into advocacy and education? Uh, in my office, not my child. We have prosecutors, right? We have, these aren't social workers, these aren't educators. These are prosecutors who are out in our schools every month talking to kids about what addiction looks like. Uh, talking to kids and parents about what to look for, how to prevent that first hit, that first high. 
so I'm very proud, again, of the prosecutors that are out doing the hard work after hours, educating and preventing. Uh, we recently did a public service announcement with the New York Islanders. Uh, Matt Martin and I did it again, so that people can see their sports heroes saying, "Wait a minute, let's take a let's let's stop for a second uh, and talk to our kids and talk to our parents uh, about addiction, about opioids." Uh, I'm also proud of the uh, funding that we gave to New Hope, which enabled them to open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because that was something that was missing here in Nassau County. So now there's treatment on demand. Uh, I'm proud to say that over 2,600 people have been treated uh, at New Hope since 2015. That's an incredible number. Uh, and I'm also proud to say that our ODs are down in Nassau County. It's a 20% reduction last year to this year. But that's still too many people that are dying every day. So yes, we're trending in the right direction, but we have so much work to do, and we can only do it if all of us join together. If we prioritize these discussions, if we put our kids first and say, you know what, let's talk to our kids about anxiety and how to cope with the anxiety of their lives. Let's talk to them about healthy alternatives. Uh, let's talk to them about addiction. Let's make sure there's treatment available. Without treatment, most people can't kick this addiction without professional help. So let's make sure we get treatment to the people who need it the most. I just want to say thank you to our sponsors uh, who brought this memorial here. Uh, and we couldn't have done it without them. It, it's a powerful exhibit uh, for all the residents of Nassau County. We couldn't do it without Northwell Health. Thank you, Carolyn and Michael Dowling. RX Realty, uh, Scott Reckler, thank you so much. Uh, the New York Mets, Flexion, Eric and Michael Blumenkrantz, Save the Michaels, Sarah Cycle, Schneider, and of course, to Roosevelt Field uh, for hosting us. And you know what, we're also fortunate in Nassau County that we have a county executive who understands these issues, who understands the pain that families are going through and is doing everything she can uh, to support all the people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do the hard work. So with that, I'd like to introduce Laura Curran. Thank you very much, District Attorney Singus, for all of your hard work. You and your team are doing a fantastic job, and I really value the partnership. Thank you. I also want to thank you for bringing this National Safety Council exhibit right here in the heart of Nassau County. I had a chance to have a look back there, these little pill-sized, faces of people, real people, and it puts literally the human face on the statistics, the harrowing statistics. And as you look at these faces, you see that people who have died because of opioids, they were babies, they were children, they were people with rich internal lives, and they had hopes, they had dreams, they had potential. And that's the thing that is the most heartbreaking about this, when young people who have this God-given potential aren't able to realize that potential. In Nassau County, as Madeline Singas said, we are working very, very hard to support families. And we do that through many ways. Of course, there's enforcement. We have um, Operation Natalie, which is a way to bring enforcement and other resources to communities that are hard hit by opioid addiction and death. We know that enforcement is not the key, and I'm so happy that many of our treatment providers are here. Education, prevention, and treatment are just as important. This exhibit will help educate people about what to do. This, I was just looking at these, I mean, for, for people to come and see that death could be lurking in their medicine cabinets is very, very powerful and very important. We have many of our sanitation departments have shed the meds where you can bring in, no questions asked, medication, drop it off, and it's disposed of in a safe way. So I want to thank you, Lorraine. I want to thank, thank the council and thank you to the district attorney for all of your hard work and for bringing this here to the heart of our county. Thank you. God blessed me with my son Vincent for 25 years. He was sensitive, kind, funny, and insightful. He was popular, he played almost every sport, and his teachers said he always brought conversations to the next level and stood up for those who couldn't stand up for themselves. The one thing that most people never knew 
was no matter how hard he tried, Vincent still battled with serious mental health issues, ADHD, trichotillomania, anxiety, low self-esteem, which eventually led to deep depression. Even though Vincent had a family that absolutely adored him, and everyone he met thought he was handsome, smart, and funny. My son Vincent never saw himself that way. Children need to be taught how to communicate and be given a variety of strategies to communicate in today's world. We have to work together. It needs to be at the family, school, and community level. Vincent started smoking marijuana in high school. Toward the end of my son's life, he shared that pot was his gateway drug into stronger drugs. When Vincent graduated, my house was no longer the place where everyone came. After high school, he was hanging around with a different crowd. During college, his A grades started to falter. Then he lost his job. Something wasn't right. I searched his room and found what I feared most. Oxycodone had become Vincent's drug of choice. We had heated discussions that oxycodone was extremely dangerous and addictive. He would show me research that denied it. As we all know, powerful companies can find ways around the law and state just about anything and get away with it. Unfortunately, things took a turn for the worse. Vincent began to isolate himself. Oxycodone amplified Vincent's anxiety and depression. He could hardly get himself to go to work or even out of the house. Vincent tried to see self-detox and get clean on his own, failing several times. Finally, in 2016, Vincent agreed his addiction was out of his control. On two separate occasions, my son was given three days to detox. Both times, my insurance company denied him the inpatient services we pleaded for. The insurance company said he didn't fit medical necessity. First, he had a supportive family. Second, he was motivated to get better. The third time the insurance company denied my son, I filed a complaint with the Attorney General's office. They appealed and they were able to get my son 14 days. 14 days. Such a short time to physically and emotionally overcome addiction. And certainly not enough time for my son, Vincent. My son came out and soon relaxed. This time, to heroin. After battling with the insurance company for months, they finally approved my son. This was our fourth attempt in the course of one year. Regrettably, unbeknownst to us, insurance companies can back deny services within 30 days of approval. After detox and 14 days, my son was back denied and had to leave. He was crying, he needed more time. They placed Vincent on anti-anxiety medicine and anti-depression medicine. He was trying to get better. He went to outpatient every day, met with his counselor weekly, and attended meetings every night. In the next few weeks, my son Vincent stayed clean. He was beginning to be himself again. However, without getting the services and the treatment he desperately needed and deserved, my son relapsed and bought drugs unknowingly laced with a deadly drug fentanyl. My son Vincent had no chance. My son Vincent passed away on September 13, 2017. Vincent's battle was like to one too many others. In his honor, I advocate for change. He had so many barriers making it so difficult to get the help he needed. Whether being denied suboxone for detox, incorrect information to determine appropriate services, or getting the Vivitrol shot to help prevent me relapse, no one should ever have to fight so hard for the basic human right to health care. Insurance companies need to comply with the 2008 Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. It's a federal law. It states that anyone with a mental health or addiction issue with the same basic human rights to health care as those who have regular medical conditions. I couldn't imagine if my son or anyone's child had a regular health disease such as diabetes or cancer, that if they had a supportive family and were motivated to get better, that they would get the denied the care they needed. Insurance companies should bear the burden of proving they are in compliance, not the consumer. The thousands of scrambled, unnumbered pages 
filled with technical codes are difficult to decipher, arrive too late, and are overwhelming at best. Insurance companies are the ones who should be held responsible to cross-reference patient information for accuracy prior to denying services, especially when, it's, when one's family is in crisis. It unjustly faces additional barriers that delay getting the need they help in. The, <clears throat> sorry, delay getting the health care that they need in time. It is my hope that by sharing my son's story, I can encourage the importance of communication, education, and most importantly, the equality for basic human rights to health care. To create change is difficult, but never impossible. We need to work together to fight the disease of addiction and create the change we want to see in our communities today. Thank you.